Hey friends, welcome back to Homestead on a Prayer. In case you're new here, I'm Jennifer. As you can see, today we're in my kitchen, but we are not going to be staying in my kitchen. I just wanted to say hi to you guys in here, and then we are going to go downstairs and I'm going to give you a pantry tour. Now, I just wanna give you guys a warning right now. If you're expecting one of those picture-perfect, amazing Homesteader pantries, where you just see hundreds and hundreds of jars of canned goods, home canned goods, and home preserved foods, everything's beautiful and organized and exactly in its place, this is not going to be the video for you. This is a real life pantry tour. So, little confession time, I'm honestly not the most organized person in the world. Also, the reality is that while we are trying to produce as much of our own food as we can, we're on a pretty small property and honestly, we're still learning. And so because of that, this is not going to be the amazing, perfect pantry. And one other reason that I didn't even mention, we live in a really small house and we don't even have a pantry. So what I'm calling my pantry is actually a combination of my basement, my garage, a few little storage areas that I'll show you guys. But kind of stocking up on food a little bit and just keeping as much of our preserved food as we can was something that was really important to us. And so because of that, we found a way to make it work the best we can. It is definitely not ideal, but it is what we can reasonably do right now. So I'm just gonna take you guys along and I'm going to show you what my real life homestead in progress pantry tour looks like. All right guys, so we're somewhere that we've never been for a video before. And honestly, I don't know if we will be down here again together. This is my basement. This is a semi-finished basement. It works, but it's not really beautiful. It's not the kind of thing that you really wanna get really excited to show people. But I decided, as I said, we're gonna do a real life pantry tour today especially because we're getting ready to start the $50 February challenge coming up really soon. And I wanted to kind of show you guys what I'm going to be working with as we get started. Now, I'm gonna be really honest with you guys and tell you that I seriously considered not filming this video. So, you know, it's not really the kind of thing that is super exciting to show people. It's kind of just pieced together. It's not all that organized. It's just kind of hodgepodge. You know, we find a little space here and there. I'm gonna be upfront about something else too, which is that we try to eat healthy for the most part, but honestly, we don't eat healthy 100% of the time. So you know what? You're gonna see my beautiful organic food. You're going to see my homegrown, home canned, home preserved food. You're going to see my bulk food stores. You're also going to see some not as healthy processed food. We try to eat healthy as much as we can, but honestly, we're dealing with a budget. So I'm just gonna go ahead and show you guys my imperfect pantry, exactly how it is, and I hope that you guys will give me some grace. So the first real storage area that we have here, this is my old desk. You can see up there, I used to make and sell jewelry, so I haven't done that in a few years, but I still have a lot of storage. That's what this desk was and for. And when we started really storing up bulk goods, this kind of was an unused space, so I just organized it a little bit, and then we were able to fit actually quite a bit of our bulk food storage here. So when I buy my bulk, you know, 25 pound, 50 pound bags of flour, sugar, food like that from Azure, I keep them in these food grade buckets here. So I actually usually cut off the label that comes with the package and tape it onto the bucket. And I'll also cut out the nutrition facts and tape that on here too. And that way we have all the information about what's in here. And you can see this is our organic bread flour, um, whole white wheat. And as you can see over here, we've got our cane sugar. Now, some of these things, when I buy a big package, they come in two buckets. You can see I've got cane sugar here, and down here I've also got cane sugar. And it didn't all fit in one bucket, so I obviously only had one label, so I just made my own label with tape. So there. when I buy something like a 50 pound bag of flour that's going to fill multiple buckets, especially if I'm continuously buying that flour, one thing that's really important to do is to label your bucket with a date to make sure that you use the oldest product so you first. can see here, this says Central Milling 722. So these two buckets are from July. This is actually my oldest flour right now. So this is the flour that we're currently refilling our upstairs canisters with. Once that's done, we're going to move on to a bag of flour that I purchased in October. Here I've got a five gallon bucket of organic jasmine rice. So this central milling flour, this is organic white all purpose flour. And then back here you saw my bread flour. These two buckets are cane sugar. This is another bucket of flour down here. Back in here, this is a two gallon bucket and a five gallon bucket, both of organic rolled oats. When I bought the big bag of oats, it didn't all fit in this bucket. So I also got the little two gallon bucket to fit the rest of it in. I keep my onions back in here in a bag. Over here, I've got a bucket of black beans. Now I don't really cook dried beans all that often. So what I like to do with that big bucket of dried beans, I like to can those up in batches and then I'll use the jars of the black beans as I need them. 
So I just keep that back there until I'm ready to can another batch, which I actually think I am. I might only have one or two jars of home canned black beans left. So down here on the shelf, I'm not sure how well you can see. I know the lighting's not the best here. This is a two gallon bucket of water glassed eggs that we water glassed over the summer. And behind it, I've got a two gallon bucket of dried cannellini beans. Up here on this shelf, I've got some jams and jellies that we preserved. We've got raspberry jam that we did together. So we preserved up all of that reduced sugar raspberry jam together, I think a few weeks ago. And there's actually in here some strawberry vanilla jam that I preserved up recently. I did make a video of that. I think by the time you see this, I don't think it will have been posted yet. So that's something to be looking out for. But we've got that. In the way back back here, we've got some pear butter that we preserved together. I've got two different flavors of that. Now over on the other side of the shelf, you can see we've got some more canned goods. In this box here, I've got a mix of applesauce and some potatoes that I preserved up. I pressure canned these with my new pressure canner. I haven't done any kind of videos on pressure canning yet because honestly it's something that I'm very new to and I'm not really confident with it yet. But we water bath canned this applesauce together back in, um, I wanna say October maybe? Then you can see I've got a couple bags of bulk goods in the back. I've got some salt, black sesame seeds, and mushroom popcorn kernels. Down here, there's some more canned goods. This is more potatoes and more applesauce that we canned together, and I think one jar of citrus pear butter that we canned up together too. Now up here on top of the desk is where I keep basically my empty stores and one random jar of red lentils. But these are all my empty canning jars. Those haven't been called into service yet. And these are empty buckets that need to be refilled. This one I believe is a sugar bucket. And this one actually the lid got damaged. I don't know if you can see it on the video. We have to replace that lid. So that's up here. And these in the back are flour, but those are empty right now. So when we need to refill, that's what we'll be filling up. So that's what we have in our actual basement for bulk goods storage. So I'm gonna take you out into my garage and I'm gonna show you some of the like the, the less homesteaderish parts of our pantry. All right, so here we are in my garage, another place I don't think we've ever been together and maybe never will be again. But this is where we store a lot of our purchased pantry goods. So you can see up here that we do actually have a lot of cereal in storage. Now, one thing, if you're trying to go to a healthy and organic lifestyle, it's important to not overwhelm yourself and not to try to do it all at once. Now, my family honestly really likes cereal. My kids love cereal. We eat quite a bit of it. And I know it's not the healthiest. It's not the best for you. It is pretty highly processed. So what we decided to do was make a change that we could live with. Rather than just getting rid of cereal completely, we decided that what we were going to do was we were gonna go ahead and switch to organic cereal. So now, as you can see, we buy organic cereal. We still buy cereal. It, I honestly, I know even though it's organic, it's not still the healthiest choice, but it's what we can do right now, and so that's what we're doing. So as you can see on these shelves through here, we just have various convenience items, various canned goods, tuna. Now some things like this I just like to have in case of emergencies because this is a good non-perishable protein source. It's relatively inexpensive, and so this is kind of a good go-to just in case anything ever happens and we're ever not able to get to the grocery store for a little bit. So that's just a good thing to have on hand. Tomato sauce, I like to use that in pizza. So we've got various vinegars, various canned beans. So of course you saw in my bulk storage, I do have quite a bit of dried beans stored up. And I do like to pressure can my own dried beans and make my own canned beans. But honestly, that's a newer thing to me. That pressure canner is new to me and I'm not really comfortable with it yet. So I had been stocking up on beans for a little while before I got that. So I'm not gonna get rid of these. We're still gonna use them, we're still gonna go through them, and I'm going to gradually switch over to canning my own beans. But for now, this is what we have, and so this is what we're using. Got lots of pasta and tomato products. Canned tomato products are another thing that I would really like to get into canning myself, but honestly, I just don't have the space to grow enough tomatoes to be able to can all the canned tomato products that we use. So down here you can see I've got salsa, sun-dried tomatoes, roasted red peppers, a few different kinds of sauce, got, um, bulk purchase of tomato paste down here. So I do like to make my own chicken broth. I make quite a bit of chicken bone broth, but honestly, I'm not able to make enough because we use quite a bit of broth. So right here, I have some organic broth stored up for whenever I'm out of my homemade broth. So as I said, I make as much as I can, but this is, this is a kind of a great fallback option for whenever I'm out and I need a little bit more. So you can see just various sauces, olive oil, vinegar, things that we can't really produce ourselves. In my most recent Azure haul, I got a bulk purchase of potatoes. So you can see I have a couple bags of potatoes here. I've also got some potatoes that I'm storing in here. I'm experimenting with storing them in shredded paper in boxes. 
If you know the best way to store potatoes for long-term storage, can you let me know? Because I, as I said, this is something I'm trying, but I haven't purchased bulk potatoes until this year, and so this is something fairly new to me. One thing I, may, I am a little concerned about is the fact that these, as you can see, are in cardboard boxes, which means that if any kind of rodent got into our garage, they could chew through these and have access to our potatoes. So I've thought about storing them maybe in like wire baskets or something like that, but if you have a great long-term storage option for potatoes, can you let me know that? I do keep them in my garage because the temperature here is about 40 degrees or so during the winter, and from what I've read, that's a pretty good storage temperature for potatoes. It's a little bit above refrigerator temperature, but it's cold enough that it should hopefully keep them from sprouting. Now, I did my previous batch of potatoes, I did store in this shredded paper as I am now, and they held up pretty well. They started getting eyes and got a little soft at the end, but at that time I had had them for several months, so that was to be expected. I did also go through those pretty fast though because we had those over Thanksgiving and Christmas where we were cooking up big batches of mashed potatoes to feed a crowd. And additionally, I did can some of those potatoes. You saw the jars back in my, back in my food storage area. I most likely will pressure can some of these red potatoes as well. I'll probably grate some of these up and freeze them into hash browns. But if you have any other ideas for either using potatoes in a way to kind of preserve them aside from just in the regular potato state, or if you have ideas for long-term storage, I'm really interested to hear both of those ideas. One other thing we keep in our garage is our bundles of garlic that we grew over the summer. Now, we've used up most of our garlic, but we still have enough left for probably a couple more months. So you over here on the side of the garage, we've got a little more garlic here. Now you can see it is starting to sprout. So this is something that's going to have to be used up fairly fast. But I find that overall our garlic stores pretty well. So I'm going to consider that a good pantry item that we have stored up. Now this isn't exactly a pantry item, but one other thing that we've been getting ready in preparation for $50 February is microgreens. So as you can see, these microgreens have a few more days to go, but they're pretty close. This tray is broccoli, and in just a couple days, these are going to be ready to harvest. This tray will last us a couple days, and you can see we have three more trays in various stages of growth lined up and ready to go. So pretty soon we'll be ready to take the blackout covers off of these and let them green up like these. And in a couple days, these will be ready and delicious. So while these microgreens are not exactly a pantry item, they are something that we can continually grow over the winter. So they're definitely something that's gonna get us through the winter and especially help us to get through this $50 February challenge that we're doing. So in addition to microgreens, one other thing that we are able to grow ourselves over the summer is, you know, there's still a little bit growing in our garden. There's not a lot out there, you know, it's cold, it's dreary. We actually don't have any snow right now, which is a little surprising, but that, you know, that's just how it is this winter. So outside in our tunnels, we have two covered tunnels out there. Most of the food that we planted in there has either been harvested or succumbed to the cold, but we do have a little bit of kale left in there. We have some Asian greens that are left. We have little bits of mosh, you know, tiny little plants, but we could make a salad out of that. We could harvest that kale and put it in soup. So there is definitely still some greenery out there that we can make use of. So we do have a few other things that are really going to help us with $50 February that I didn't show you in the pantry tour. We have lots of frozen food in our refrigerator. We have lots of zucchini that I preserved up from the garden this summer. We have lots of kale that I preserved from the garden this summer. We have some herbs that I've frozen. We have lots of chicken broth that I've made and frozen in the freezer. So there's going to be lots of things in there that will help us get through that challenge. We also have strawberries, raspberries, blueberries, lots of things that we either grew or picked fresh at local orchards this summer. So there's going to be a lot of that that's really going to help supply our fruit and vegetable needs over the summer. One thing that we're going to be relying on really heavily is eggs. Now, as you can see, our chickens are back, not quite in full production, but they're in production again. So we've been getting a couple eggs every day now, and as you can see, we've built up a little basket here. We have still been going through our water glass eggs that we water glass together over the summer, and I was kind of prioritizing using those first, so our fresh eggs have been building up here. But we're going to, but we're going to just use both of those over this challenge. I think they're both really going to help a lot. So that's a really good affordable source of protein that we can produce ourselves here at our home. So now if you've watched this video, you've heard me mention $50 February a few times. If you're new to my channel, then you may not really know what I'm talking about. So $50 February is a challenge that's hosted by Rich over at the Old Sweets Farm. I'm gonna go ahead and link his channel in the video description so you can check it out and get more information about that challenge. 
basically I was challenged to participate in this by Katie at Mayfield Ranch. So I'm going to link her channel too. Definitely check out both of their channels. Those are two great channels to check out. But the whole purpose of this challenge is to basically see how, I don't want to say exactly self-sufficient, but how well you can do on a month just with food that you've either grown yourself, that you are able to barter for, that you have sourced locally, just food that doesn't come from the big national food supply chain. It's kind of trying to make your food purchases for the month of February a little more localized. So obviously doing that completely is very challenging. So we all have a little bit of grace. We have $50 that we can spend at the regular grocery store in the month of February for two people. For each person in your family, you add an additional $25. Since we're a family of four, we get an extra 50. So we will be spending $100 in the month of February. So basically how I'm planning to do that is to break it up into two shopping trips and shop for two weeks at a time. So I'm gonna spend $50 on each shopping trip. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna meet you here um, about halfway through February, and then again at the end of February, I'm gonna show you what I purchased with my $50. And I'm going to show you basically all the dinners that I made with those purchases. So I'm going to show you what we used from what we purchased and what we used that we had stored up here. So I hope that you guys will join me for that challenge. I'm really excited to start. I think it's gonna be a lot of fun. It might be challenging. I mean, challenge is in the name after all. So it might be a little bit tricky, but I think it's going to be a fun challenge and I think it's going to be a learning challenge. So I'm excited about it. So I definitely hope that you guys will join me for that. Either way, thank you so much for joining me for this pantry tour today. I hope that this pantry tour inspired you to know that you do not need to have a ton of space. You do not need to have the perfect homestead and be completely self-sufficient to have a nice store of food. You know, we have probably several months of food stored up, even though we're not a full functioning homestead. We're just kind of, you know, we're homestead on a prayer. We're kind of on our way towards being a homestead on a budget. So, you know, we do the best we can. That's all, that's all any of us can do. So I thank you guys so much for joining me. I hope you're having a great day, and I can't wait to see you again soon. Bye, guys. I'll see you next time.